In this video, we try to understand and quantify how well a control chart performs. We use control charts because we know that quality is not optional in our systems anymore. Customers are very mobile and quickly move on to suppliers that can provide high quality, consistent products. And that's what process monitoring is all about, ensuring that consistency is in place. I also want to mention before we get started that process monitoring is often referred to as statistical process control the statistical part being the key word. I avoid this term, however, because of the confusion with regular process control, which is the principle where we apply feedback continuously to check for deviations and to make changes to our process in an automated way. Process monitoring is very different to feedback control, and that's why I avoid the term SPC. Firstly, process monitoring is not applied automatically. Adjustments should be made to the process infrequently and only when we see evidence for it in the control charts, when we say that something different, a special cause, has occurred. Action from a process monitoring chart is taken manually. Feedback control is very different. Feedback control is a temporary measure that is taken in an automated way when a deviation is detected. It makes a very minor adjustment regularly to the process. The thought process behind monitoring is that when we detect a deviation, we should figure out what the root cause is and make a permanent change to our system so that that cause does not occur in the future. Actually, in the prior example that I showed you with the froth monitoring, the operators noticed the signature of the bubble size decreasing and the color increasing. In an ideal world, they would figure out what causes this and prevent it from ever reoccurring. Actually, in this situation, it was a function of the property of the raw material, the ore coming out of the ground, that periodically changes. So this is something that they cannot change, really. But Japanese companies do this very well. They are credited for their high level of quality. And one of the key reasons is because they find a permanent change to their processes to avoid problems from reoccurring. Feedback control actually introduces variation into our system. It makes a very minor adjustment and does so with regularity to the process, with the hope that it counteracts a disturbance to keep the process on target. In an ideal world, we would never need to apply feedback control. In an ideal world, we would never even have variations entering into our process in the first place to cause these destabilizing effects. But for processes where quality is critical, it is worth aiming for that standard. Since we don't live in such an ideal world, we must have feedback control, however, to automatically adjust for small deviations. And then we also have process monitoring sitting on top of that at a higher level to detect when larger deviations occur of very irregular, abnormal situations. And that is why these monitoring charts use plus and minus three sigma limits. Something really has to go wrong before those limits are triggered. We established in the prior video that such three sigma limits under the assumption of normally distributed variation means that one in 370 samples will fall outside the limit, even if the process is normally distributed and behaving okay. That value of 1 in 370 is called the false alarm rate. In other areas, it is also known as the producer's risk. Or if we are dealing with diseases and in the medical area, we would call this a false positive. In the area of statistics, we give this the name of a type 1 error. And we would like to reduce type 1 errors by as much as possible. A high false alarm rate will be a very quick recipe for operators to simply ignore your control chart. There is a different type of error. The other situation is when the process is not stable, but the x-bar values still lie within the limits, meaning that we don't detect the problem. This is called a false negative, or also known as the consumer's risk, or a false acceptance rate. In statistics, we give this the name a type 2 error. Similar to the type 1 error, we would also like to reduce type 2 errors as much as possible. Neither of these errors are desirable. A type 1 error raises an alarm where none exists and a type 2 error does not raise an alarm when one should have been raised. I prefer to use the language of false alarms or false negatives. I do, however, want to point out how asymmetrical they are. And to do that, let's use a situation we might have all encountered, a visit with a doctor and being diagnosed with some medical issue, such as a disease. Which would you find preferable, to have a false positive or a false negative for a diagnosis? Remember, a false positive would say that you have the disease when in fact you don't. A false negative would indicate that you don't have the disease when in fact you do. Notice the asymmetry here. 
A false positive diagnosis would be much more preferable than a false negative. You can always have a second opinion or a third opinion, but a false negative leaves you with the wrong impression that everything is okay when it in fact is not. Here are some further examples to think about. What about screening for weapons at an airport security checkpoint? Which do you prefer to have happen? A type 1 error or a type 2 error, especially if you're a passenger? Or what about a trial at a jury? Which would you rather have? The jury making a type 1 error or a type 2 error to set a potential defendant free or not? But back to our processes. We make type 1 errors or type 2 errors. If you get too many false alarms, we can simply make our control limits wider. Make your lower control limit lower and your upper control limit even higher still. That will reduce your false alarms. Eventually, if you make them wide enough, your type 1 error rate will go to zero. Your new bounds are so wide, you capture almost all the variability in the system. Remember, there is no rule that you have to use plus or minus 3 sigma. That is simply there by convention. If you want to use wider bounds or even narrower bounds, you're absolutely free to adjust them where you like them to be. However, you will get to a point where you make those bounds so wide, you will never get a false alarm. But in that situation, I'd like you to think what has happened to your type 2 error rate, the false negative rate. Remember when the process is not stable but still lies within the limits is a type 2 error. Having those wide limits means that you've now captured everything inside them, including problematic operation when the process is not stable. So your type 2 error rate has gone up, while your type 1 error rate has gone down. There is never a free lunch. You cannot have low type 1 error as well as low type 2 error. One is always traded off against the other. So finding the right level for those bounds is absolutely critical for an effective monitoring chart. I cannot stress enough how much time is spent going into varying those limits to get just the right type 1 and type 2 error rates. Calculating the limits for a control chart is easy. Testing the control chart to make sure that it is operating at those right levels of errors is hard and time consuming. Now in the next video, we'll look at some practical implementation aspects of using these control charts.